that I would rather you know do this all over again it uh, will be faster and uh, that kind of does imply that there might be a few things in the previous recording which might not be in here and vice versa given that I do not use slides uh, you don't really need to do both of these if you've done the first one in spite of that irritating sound in the background you're fine you don't need to look at this one and if you are doing this one you don't need to look at that one there's only one thing that i wanted to chat about uh, which was uh, the syllabus for each and every one or the testable component for each and every one of the quizzes uh, the practicum and the final practicum uh, some people ask me what they were. I usually tell you about those in the lectures. The reason why I do not have that in Britain is because depending upon the number of questions that are asked in class, sometimes I speed up, sometimes I slow down. Um, the intention is not to shove something down your throat. I would rather that all of you be comfortable in terms of what you've done, in terms of what you've learned. Uh, rather than uh, knowing a certain amount and knowing little of it. So depending upon how much we've covered till that day or the, till the week previous to the one that you are going to have your test in, I am not going to you know, give you your syllabus before that. It's going to be given to you during the lectures um, and you'll probably get an email from me or one of the tutors or the exam coordinator who's going to tell you what the syllabus is also in addition to what's happening in the lectures okay so let's start off two things that we are going to look at today the first one is the scientific method now the scientific method as you focus upon in business is probably going to be a little bit different from what you are going to see in uh, let's say psychology or in statistics I mentioned psychology and statistics um, primarily because marketing as a discipline is not a pure discipline. So you are either a major or a master in uh, economics or in psychology or in statistics, the three of those. So I, for example, am a major in economics. If you're in consumer behavior, you are a major in psychology. So we borrow a lot from those disciplines. Okay? which is what's happening in market research, which is primarily uh, focused around statistics with its applications in psychology as of right now. Later on, when you do 3090, it's going to be focused more on um, you know, mathematics also, high levels of statistics and so on. So we are going to go back to statistics and psychology very often. So coming back to uh, <clears throat> what we are going to be doing today, the scientific method with slight differences. And I'll tell you what the differences are as we go along. Uh, and then second, we are going to look at frequencies, cross tabs, and the introduction to your very first test, which is going to be a chi-square test. Again, a chi-square test, and I mentioned this previously, is the basis of tests. A chi-square test is a very flexible test. But a chi-square test is also a very useless test. So we'll talk about that when we um, get to the chi-square and why it's good and why it's bad, why it's not used in real life as much. So we'll talk about that. It's not that it's not used. It's just that it's not, especially in this age of big data, the amount of use that it's put to is relatively low. Now, starting today, I'm also going to bring down my reliance on slides. There are going to be, there's going to be one more lecture, which is going to be closer to week eight. If I'm, uh, again, depending upon the speed that we uh, go with, where I'm going to come back and look into the slides deeply, where I use them as a backup. But most of the places I will not. Um, having said that, I would want you to have a look at these slides anyway, because they sometimes talk about the statistics or the psychology behind what we are doing. I'm never going to test you on these. Okay? What you're going to be tested on, what you're going to be assessed on is the lectures, nothing outside of the lectures. But there will come a time, there will hopefully come a curiosity when you want to go back and look at statistically what does something mean or psychologically what does something mean. That's when you go back to the slides. That's the only time when you go back to the slides. Over and above that, you don't need to. Um, again, 
at the end of today's lecture you should be able to take those two things away the scientific method and a chi-square test so let's start off first with the scientific method for the scientific method what i'm going to do i'm going to use this as a blackboard <clears throat> where I will write a little. Now, writing implies <clears throat> not to uh, lovely, uh, you know, handwriting coming out on these. I tried using a pen with my Microsoft Surface. That doesn't work out too well either because then uh, <clears throat> something else goes wrong. So I'm going to use a mouse to write this. Most of this is going to be self-explanatory. If there are any questions on these, just let me know. Okay. And uh, like I said, preferably contact me on Teams. I'm a lot faster on Teams, uh, especially for this trimester. Hopefully next year onwards is going to be a little bit okay. So we start off today with what is known as the scientific method. Now, again, like I said, this is going to be slightly different from what you have learned in other disciplines. Now, what does the scientific method mean? <clears throat> the scientific method means that whatever you want to prove is by definition false. You are trying to prove something, whatever that statement is, that statement is false. That is your inception, that is your point of inception. That's where you start off with all scientific method. Because if you start off with your statement being true, you've already taken the stance that you are right. So you are starting off with the assumption that the party in front of you is guilty. That's not what you want. You start off with innocent until proven guilty, which implies every single statement that you make is incorrect unless and until you can prove it to be true. So this phone is black. I want to prove that this phone is black. So my starting statement has to be this phone is not black. That's the scientific. That's the start of the scientific method. Now, when you look at psychology, when you look at statistics, this starting point makes a lot of sense, okay? which is the opposite of what you want to prove. Business does this a slightly, in a slightly different fashion, not very different. It means exactly the same thing. It's just that we take the second step first, which implies that we start off with writing down what we want to prove. So let me write this down. Phone is black. This is a statement I want to prove. This is the statement that I want to prove. Okay. I write this down, but this is not what I start off with. In hypotheses testing in this scientific method. I just introduced a new term, which was called hypothesis, T-H-E-S-I-S, hypothesis testing, or hypothesis testing, depending upon uh, how your accent rolls. What is hypothesis testing? Hypothesis testing is the basis for the scientific method. In business, I'm going to give you that perspective and then I'm going to give you the perspective of statistics. In business, we are going to start off with what we want to prove. We write that down. And the statement that we want to prove is known as HA. What does H stand for? H stands for hypothesis. That word in here. Nobody writes hypotheses. What you write is an H. What is A? A stands for alternate. The statement that you want to prove is known as 
an alternate hypothesis. Okay, be very careful. It's the statement that you want to prove. It is sometimes also written as H1. Both of these are very well accepted terms. You can use HA or H1. In business, we tend to use alternate, but we also use H1. Okay, but preferences towards the use of the term alternate. Okay. So the phone is black is what I want to prove. I write that down as phone is black and I call it the alternate, the statement that I want to prove. The exact opposite of this, now the exact opposite is something that you will need to learn as you go along. By the end of the semester, in fact, by the middle of the semester, you're not going to be writing hypotheses because it's going to be there at the back of your head. And I'm not going to ask you to write those. But right now, we're going, we're taking a stepwise approach. So we'll go step by step and we are going to write the exact opposite of this, which is known as, which is written as H0, sometimes also called the null. So we call this the alternate, we call this the null. My suggestion would be, Again, although all the tutors and all the graders for this class know about this, I would suggest that you use the terms H0 and HA. Okay. Let me go over and above that, I'll leave up to you. So if you use, if you are from psychology and you end up using H1, you're fine. Okay. So we are going with HA and H0. H0 is the exact opposite of the statement that you want to prove phone is not black. So you have the null and the alternate, you have the H naught and the HA. Between the two statements, all possibilities should be covered. If all possibilities are not covered, if any possibility is missed out, then your hypothesis statement is incorrect. So that's what you have to be really, really careful about. To give you an example, let's suppose I write my H naught as phone is gray, EY, AY, whatever you want to use. The phone is gray. It's different from the alternate but the phone might be blue, the phone might be purple, the phone might be anything at all. Anything at all. So we do not want a set of statements that does not cover the entire set of possibilities. That's something that you learn with practice. You'll notice that once we start writing this mathematically, it's going to become a little simpler there are some places where it's very difficult to write this mathematically. To start off with, when we do cross tabs today, when we do chi-squares chi today, you'll notice that it's relatively difficult to write uh, H0. In which case, I'm not even going to ask you to write one mathematically. So we are going to switch between English and math symbols, and I'll explain that as we go along. So two statements before we want to run any kind of test. That's what the focus should be. There are two types of statements, one that you want to prove, and the second that's the exact opposite of what you want to prove. The null, which is the exact opposite of what you want to prove, and the alternate, which is what you want to prove. Before we go any further into hypothesis testing or the scientific method, I'm going to tie this slightly with statistics so that you see the direction that we are going in. That's the most important part. Every single test that you do is going to be centered around, and we mentioned this in the past, the value of P. Okay. What is P? P is the possibility of making an error. This is also known as statistics, uh, SPSS, uh, just to give you an example, doesn't really 
always write down P. Sometimes it uses the term significance. How significant is a test? So the number that you are going to get is going to be P is equal to 0.02, let's say. Or you're going to get significance equal to 0 0.02. Or you're going to get significance equal to 0 0.20. Significant or p equal to point three zero. These are the possible numbers that you can get. You can get any number between zero and point nine nine. Okay. Zero and point nine nine, you can get anything at all. There's also a very small possibility of getting one, but we'll leave that aside. That usually doesn't happen. Okay. So this number that you get, which is the probability or the significance consider this to be a percentage okay. it's a percentage what is why a percentage it's a percentage because it's a number that varies between zero and one and this percentage should be read as this p-value this significance we're not going the statistics route we are going the business route it's in easy it's intuitive it might not be statistically kosher but it's good enough what does this number represent? It represents the possibility that your HA is incorrect. Okay, again, it's the possibility that your alternate is incorrect. So let's look at, let us suppose we ran a test. What does this 0.02 mean? This 0.02 means there's a 2% chance, 2%. Why 2%? 0 0.02 is equal to 2%. There's a 2% chance that your alternate is incorrect, which means there's a 98% chance that your alternate is correct. Okay, so that is how you should be interpreting this p-value. Again, it tells you the percentage probability of your alternate being incorrect. Let's look at p equal to 0 0.20. 20% chance that your alternate is incorrect. 30% chance that your, in, your uh, alternate is incorrect. So that's how you read a p-value. A p-value is always for the alternate. It's never for the null. It's never for H0. It's always for HA. Keep that at the back of your head. And unlike what psychology and statistics will tell you, in the market research industry, when you give reports to your managers, what do you say? You say, the chances of making an error are 2% and hence I accept the alternate. Okay? In psychology, you would not say this. They're going to throw you out. In statistics, they're going to throw you out. Okay? You'll say you have no reasons to reject the null. You will not do that in Again, if you want to, that's fine. All the people who are going to be grading your uh, answer sheets know about it. But as a manager, a manager does not know the nuances of statistics. You need to tell the manager specifically what you found to be correct. Did you find the alternate to be correct or did you find the null to be correct? So that should be the focus of a marketing The preference for black phones
second. My null is first is less than second. Something is missing in here, which is there's a possibility that both of them, the preference is exactly the same. And that implies you have to put an equal to sign less than or equal to. Okay. What does less than and equal to mean? Why is it that we are putting that equal to? Because between HA and H0, every single possibility needs to be covered. See this equal to? This equal to is looking at that certain case, that very small little case where the preference for black phones and white phones is the same. This equal to will always be a part of the null. Why is this equal to going to be a part of the null always? Let's look upon that. Let's look at that. Let's start off in a new slide completely. And I'm going to start off with a new example. And I'm going to use an example which uh, is available with the data set that you have. So the data set that you have deals with cars. I'm hoping most of you are at least a little bit familiar with it right now. So it deals with cars. And I am going to make a small prediction, which intuitively might make sense to you. You might agree with it, you might not. This is the good part about statistics. You start off with an opinion. You start off an opinion which is based on intuition, which is based on experience. If you are wrong, statistics will correct you. Okay. If you decide to say something without the backing of a hypothesis, that's your opinion. And there's nothing wrong with having opinions just as long as you don't consider them to be facts. You have to prove them to be facts. An opinion is the starting point. A fact has to be proved. There's also a step in the middle which is known as a proposition, but we are not going to look at it in this particular class. So let's start off with a simple intuitive feeling that I have about cars, which might or might not be correct. We'll see, uh, we have the data, we'll check whether or not it's correct. We kind of feel somewhere in our guts that men tend to care more about speed than women do. Okay. So I am going to say men care more about speed than women do. Okay. So that's what I want to, I think is correct. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit about the statement. Men and women. Which men or women are we talking about? Okay. Is this all the men versus all the women? Is this about my target segment? Is this about the sample that I have chosen of 150 people? The answer is it will depend. It will never be about the sample. It is usually about the market that you are selling to. If I were a scientist, I would say this particular question is about all men and women. But I'm not a scientist. I'm a market researcher who's working for a particular company. In this case, I'm working for Ford Motor Company. And Ford tells me I need to know, which means Ford needs to know who cares more about speed, men or women. 
So in which case, if men care more about speed, I'm going to advertise speed to them. Women care more about, let's say, safety. I'm going to advertise safety to women. It always needs to translate into one of the four Ps. So in this case, I'm advertising something different to men, something different to women. Okay. So men care more about speed than women do is something that I want to prove. The first thing I need to know is who am I selling to? Who are these men and women? And as a business person, I'm always going to say, apologies, as a business person, I'm always going to say it's about my market. I don't care about men and women who live in Timbuktu, somewhere in the middle of nowhere. I care about, as Ford selling in Australia, I care about the men and the women in Australia who are of a driving age. Okay, so this is the market, the definition of the market. We've talked about this before. Let's talk about it again. A market is any person who has the slightest chance of buying my product. As a manager of Ford Motor Company Australia, a person in Timbuktu has zero chance of buying my product. So the market is any person who has the slightest chance of buying my product. For me, a market is statistically what is known as the population which means anybody who has the slightest power, slightest chance of buying my product is my market and he or she is also my population outside of that population nobody exists it's just inside that population where everybody seems to exist and every single time when we say men women old young rich poor we are always talking about the population a hypothesis always talks about a population some guy is going to come up and say but what if we have a theory about the sample Sure, that's a different story altogether, but pretty much as a default, you always have a hypothesis that deals with the population. Now, what is the population for Ford Motor Company? Australia has a population of, uh, let's go with 25 million, of which approximately 60% people are of driving age. So out of 25 million people, that leaves us with... Uh, Let's go with 16 million people. 16 million people are uh, of driving age, of which about half have a car, 8 million people left. Out of these 8 million people, let's say 4 million are in the market for buying a new car. That's my population. Again, I'm never going to ask you how to calculate a population, but a population is anybody who has the chance of buying a product buying your product so every single statement that we make is going to be focused upon the population it's always about the population it's never about the sample but am i going to go and survey all those four million people nope why because it's going to cost me a lot of time it's going to cost me a lot of money by that time, Subaru is going to go come and take away all of my market. And by the time I survey the four millionth person, the first person that I surveyed has changed his or her opinions. So you never sample the population. You sample from the population. So this is a very lovely statement in statistics. You never sample the population. You sample from the population. So from these four million people, how many do we survey? It depends on how confident we want to be. Now, I usually show this using a diagram in class, which obviously can't be done in here. For every single question that you ask, and again, if you are from stats, you are probably going to tell me that what I'm saying is uh, incorrect. I know it's incorrect. I have a major in statistics, so I know about that. But most of the times, 
for every question that you ask. Okay? So you have a survey, it's got one question, how many people should you survey? And I, I pretty much there's always a person in the class who gives me the answer, it's 30. If you have one question that you ask, you want 30 responses. Why 30? Because 30 is where a T distribution changes into a Z distribution. If you don't understand what this means, don't worry about it. But a Z distribution is what we in pretty much everyday term know as a normal curve. That kind of tells us that it's good to have 30 responses per question. What if we have two questions? 60? The answer is not really. It's going to be a number slightly less than 60. How much le less? It depends upon the correlations. We won't get into that. What we are going to say is that for every question that I ask, if I want to be about, you know, get that probability of 5%, 5% or less being incorrect, I want about 30 questions, 30 responses to every questions that every question that I ask. So if I ask 10 questions, probably around 300 responses. Again, that number is going to be smaller. It's going to get smaller in terms of its increase, the more the questions that we ask. But that's what you're looking at. So we are going to, from this population, I thought we had narrowed it down to 4 million people who have the slightest chance of buying my product. I sample 400 people. Oops, sorry about that. I sample 400 people. This is this number is known as my sample. We sample the sample. Okay. 400 people from 4 million people and ask them all the questions. If you can understand these next two minutes, most of statistics is going to be under your control. So based on these 400 people, based on these 400 people, we make a prediction about the 4 million people. How good is that production, projection going to be? I don't know. Nobody knows. But that is why that p-value. The p-value tells you how good do you expect the projection to be. The black and white phone question. In the sample, let us say the breakup was 60% like black, 40% like white. How confident can I be that in the population of 4 million, the split is going to be something similar? That is what statistics is going to do. Okay. The confidence, statistics can never give you the right answer. It can give you the right answer with a certain probability, certain percentage of you being correct. I'm using the term probability as an English term rather than anything else. The percentage that, the percentage confidence that you can have that your answer is going to be correct. There are a lot of assumptions that go in here. We are not going to look at the assumptions. Okay? We are just focused upon what statistics is supposed to do. Based on a small sample, make a projection about the population and tell you how confident you are about that projection. That's what is going to happen. Now, second thing. For these 400 people, do I know the percentage of people who like black and the percentage of people who like white? Yes, I do. So the sample characteristics are known to me. The 150 people who responded to my survey, known to me. How much do they like my car? Known to me. How much do the people in the population like my car, all the 4 million people? Not known to me. 
So I know everything about the sample. Why? Because I've already collected the sample. What do I know about the population? Nothing. I'm just making projections about the population. So, in terms of representation, anything to do with the sample is written as an English letter. So the mean of the sample is small x, that's a small x, x bar. This is the statistic that all of you know as the mean. The mean of the population is written in terms of Greek letters, in this case mu, which is mean of population. Okay. Now, do we know the mean of the sample? Yes, we do. Let us suppose we ask the sample, we ask them a simple question. Are you satisfied with my car? The car that I sell you? Are you satisfied with it? You've been driving it for some time. What is your overall satisfaction? On a scale of one to seven. And this person tells me, all these 400 people or 150 people together tell me, on a scale of one to seven, 6.7. So my sample seems to be very satisfied with me. Let me assume that uh, if I get a six or above on a seven, I consider my product to be good. If I get anything less than a six, I consider my product to be bad. Okay. So in the, in the sample, mean is equal to 6.7, so people are happy. Can I say with confidence that in the population, the mean of satisfaction will be greater than six. Based on the pattern that I have seen here, based on the pattern that I've seen in the sample, how confident can I be that in the population, satisfaction will be greater than six? Notice that for the sample, I have used an English letter. For the population, I have used a Greek letter. You see that? X bar versus mu. And when I run this test, I'm going to get, let's say P less than point, or let's say P equal to 0 0.02. What does that imply? This implies that there is a 2% chance of making an error if I accept that the population mean is greater than 6. 2% chance. Okay. What have I done? I know this. I want to prove this. I ran a test. What test did I run? We'll learn about these tests as we go along. And that test told me that there's a 2% chance of making an error. Okay. But how did this test happen? What's the logic behind all of these tests? How do these tests work? All of these tests work. And this is slightly, uh, it, if it's confusing to you, don't worry about it. But I'm telling you how all of these tests work. So out of these 400 people, and look at what's going to happen in here, out of these 400 people that gave me uh, my survey, 190 of them told me 7 out of 7. And again, these numbers might not add up. This is just hypothetical. 200 told me it's a 6 out of 7. And 
whatever is left, 10 people told me it's a five out of seven. Okay. These are the 400 people who responded. Compare this with another 400 people. Let's suppose this is not what the result was. It was Two hundred and ninety told me seven out of seven. One hundred and ten told me one out of seven. Okay. And let us suppose the means of the two of the same are the same. They are not going to be the same, but let's hypothetically assume that the means of the two are the same. Where are you going to be more confident that? the mean of the population is going to be greater than six in here or in here in here everybody is bunched together so if we take more people they are probably going to be bunched in here in here on the other hand people are bunched far away there's one bunch in here there's one bunch in here it's possible that this bunch grows and suddenly the mean changes drastically it's also, also possible that this bunch grows and the mean moves in the other direction. People are all over the place. That's the English term of statistics. Are people all over the place or are people concentrated together? If people are concentrated together in terms of their opinions, in terms of their ideas, in terms of their liking, I can make a confident projection. If everybody hates me, in my sample, I can say probably everybody's going to hate me in the population. If everybody loves me in the population, I can probably say everybody loves me in the population. In the sample, I'll probably say everybody loves me in the population. If half the people hate me, really drastically hate me, detest me, and the other half people are ecstatic about me in the sample, then I don't know what the population looks like. And that is the basis of statistics. That is what is being captured in all of these tests through a measure known as, most of you would have heard of this, standard deviation, or you might have heard of this as a variance. Both of these are what are known as measures of dispersion. We don't need to worry too much about it. I'm not going to in detail in uh, this class but this is what all tests are based on so what I'm going to do next is sorry, is start writing down a few hypotheses with you okay. I'll explain what it means and what I'm going to do today is start off with a mathematical representation, not because it's better in any manner or form. I'm not going to ever say that a mathematical representation is better, but it's a little more succinct. It's to the point, and it's very easy to understand what's going on without reading a lot. There will be times, uh, especially today, when you will notice that uh, writing out a statistic uh, uh, mathematical notation is not very easy in which case you can slip back to English so move whichever way you want anything is fine as I told you all the tutors and the graders are very you know well versed in terms of uh, are very well versed in terms of statistics so they should be fine no matter what you give them so I'm going to go back to the example of the black phone and the white phone I think opinion, no statistics, no fact. My opinion is A alternate, which is my opinion, which is what I want to prove, is that black phones are preferred over white phones. Look at how I'm going to write this. I can write this down in English just the way I said it. Black phones are preferred over white phones. Mu. Mu is the Greek letter symbolizing the mean of 
the population. So in the population, the average liking for a black phone is greater than the average liking for a white phone. How have they been measured? It's a very simple measure. I gave them a question which says, on a scale of one to seven, notice it says one to seven, which means it's a continuous variable, but we'll get to that in about 10 minutes or so. On a scale of one to seven, how much do you like a black phone? That's question number one. And question number two, on a scale of one to seven, how much do you like a white phone? That's it, I've asked two questions. And I've asked these two questions to, let's say, 150 people. I've asked these questions to 150 people. When I asked this question to 150, 150 people, I got an average, which is, let's say, 6.8 for black phones, 5.9 for white phones. I already know what's happening in the sample. In the sample, what do I get? 5.9 for white phones, 6.8 for black phones, so I already know. In the sample, you already know. What do I know? That the mean for black phones is higher than the mean for white phones. If it was the other way around, your sample disproves you, so there's no reason to go on ahead. There is actually, we'll talk about that later. But a sample, you already have the numbers. So sample, you already know. Be careful about that. Sample, you already know that. 6.8 is the liking for black phones. 5.9 is the liking for white phones. Assuming there's a market of 1 million for phones. Based on these 150 people, can we make the prediction? Can we make the prediction that liking for black phones in the population is higher than the liking for white phones in the population. In the sample, we already know this being x black, this being x, sorry, x white. We already know this. That's the sample. Based on the 6.8 and 5.9, and how varied people are, how much do they vary? Based on that, how confidently can I say that? That is what our test is going to be. That is what all tests are going to be. There's one more step left though, which is, I have to still write my null. My null is, notice the equal to, the equality always has to be, always has to be a part of the null. It can never ever be a part of alternate. You can never prove two things to be equal. Statistically, it's impossible to prove two things to be equal unless you go through the whole population. So you can't sit on the fence. You have to say one is greater than the other. The second is greater than the first. There's also one more thing you can do, which is a very non-committal approach, but is absolutely valid. If you don't have intuition, about a certain subject. Let's say you don't know whether black phones are going to be more preferred than white phones. You are absolutely free to write. UB is not equal to U white, or you can also write it as both these symbols are perfectly fine. The problem in this case is, and sometimes this is the best way to go, the problem with this case is that what you are saying is that you don't have an opinion. Again, nothing wrong with this, 
but this is a kind of a cop-out approach. You have not looked at literature, you have not tried to use your intuition, you have not tried to use your brains. Sometimes you don't know about it, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with it, but preferably a directional relationship tells you that you are, you have some knowledge about the subject and that you want to prove it. Okay. So make sure that you have an alternate and a null that's written down. This is right now just for practice. And I promise you, um, I kind of said this at the beginning of this uh, today's lecture, is that sometimes you will uh, not need to write a hypothesis. And that sometime is probably going to come in about week seven or so. Well, actually week eight, given that you have a break week in the middle. So that sometime is going to come in the middle. Okay. If it comes in the middle, that point of time you want to stop writing hypotheses, I'm fine with it. But as of right now, practice, in fact, uh, your uh, uh, second practicum, whatever that is, you are going to be asked to write hypotheses. Okay, so let's suppose somebody comes and says, I want to prove, let's not look at black and white phones any longer, I want to prove that men and women care about speed of a car equally, which means Those are not used, those are supposed to be muse. Sorry about that. Okay. Somebody comes and says this. What's your alternative? So your answer is going to be Oh, sorry. There's a problem in here though, which is that you just wrote equality in an alternate. That's something that you can never do. So your hypothesis, males equal to females, is incorrect. Your hypothesis is incorrect, you can't do it. You have to go ahead and change this. No matter what the statement says, no matter what the statement says, your alternate cannot have an equality. Change this to that, to that, or to that. That's going to be your starting point. The corresponding H naughts for all these three are going to be, this is not equal to, equal to. Let's write this down. For the second one, greater than, so less than equal to, less than, greater than equal to. Notice that the equality is always in the null and that's the way it has to be. Okay. So that is the hypothesis testing. That is the entire section on hypothesis testing. Everything that you want to prove is false to start off with. That becomes your alternate. Then you write the null. The alternate first and the null second. This is very contrary to what you will learn in psychology and statistics, which is fine. Business does not go this, you know, the perfect scientific route. So second step, you write the null. Third step, third step, you choose the test that you want to run. Let's write these down because these are very important. Step one, write the HA. Step two, write the H naught. During these steps, remember the equality needs to be in the H naught. And third step is check or identify the test that you need to run. Okay. There are steps four or five. We won't get to those right now. We'll get to them starting week five. Okay. Three steps. Write the alternate. Write the null. Check the test. Now the next question becomes, how do you check the test? And the answer about what test should be run is based on what we did in the last lecture, which was identifying the three types of variables. Remember I told you if you have a mastery on which variable you are working with, 
let's have the class understood. Okay. So we'll go ahead and work on that. Sorry. Now. And we are going to start off with something really simple, which is known as a chi square test. C H I, you can pronounce it to be a T squared or a key square, whatever you want. The accepted definition is a chi square test. So Accepted pronunciation is a chi-square test, so I would suggest you go over that. Uh, chi seems to be very popular uh, in Australia, but that is not the correct pronunciation across the world. That's not the accepted pronunciation around the world. But it's a proper noun. Pronounce it anyway. You know, pronounce it any way you want. So, what is a chi-square test? A chi-square test is a test that can be run on all variables, anything at all. That's the focal thing about a chi-square test. So that's the good part about the test. The bad part is it doesn't tell you anything except for the fact that a relationship exists between two variables. Okay. Income, age. Age and income are related. Chi-square test can tell you that. How are they related? As income goes up, Age goes down, as income goes up, age goes up, as age goes up, income goes up, as age goes up, income goes down. That relationship is missing. The direction of the relationship is missing. So it doesn't tell you anything over and above the fact that a relationship exists, which is sometimes all right, but most of the times it's not. If you want to know more about it, a manager being told that People tend to like uh, different colors. Yeah, that's fine, but what colors? Who tends to like what colors? Those are something that a manager needs to be interested in. If they're not interested in that, if you can't give me that, as a manager, the fact that people like different colors, that's useless to me. So which is why a chi-square test is a very flexible test, but it's a very poor test. So we are gonna avoid it as much as possible Unfortunately, and uh, again, unfortunately is uh, relative. There is a certain circumstance where no other test can be run. There's only one test that can be run. Only one test, which is the chi-square test. So let's look at this in a little bit of detail. Reminding you about the types of variables that are available to us. So the types of variables that are available to us that we classify variables into are number one, nominal. What's a nominal variable? A nominal variable is a variable where there is no order to the answers that people can give you. No order to the answers people can give you. Males and females. Going to, from males to females or females to males. Which one's better? I don't know. Which one's higher? I don't know. Races. Asian, Hispanic, Caucasian, uh, Blacks. Which one's higher? I don't know. There is no order to them. I said Asians, Hispanics, Caucasians, Blacks. I could say hey, Asians, Caucasians, Blacks, Hispanics. I could say Hispanics, Blacks, Asians, um, Asians. There is no order to this. So that's a nominal verb. Just a recollection, nothing else. Just a reminder, nothing else. The second type of variable is known as an ordinal variable. What is an ordinal variable? An ordinal variable is a variable where there is order to the possible answers of a question. What is your education? Just completed school? High school? Sorry, uh, college? Masters? PhD? four categories. There's an increasing level of education. Income, less than 25,000, 25 to 50, 50 to 75, 75 to 100. Four categories, four possible answers. There's an order to it, an ordinal variable. The two of these put together 
ordinal and nominal variables put together are called, if you have forgotten, they are called categorical variables. Categorical variables, nominal and ordinal. What's the second type of variable? Or the third type in this case? Continuous variable. What's a continuous variable? There is actually nothing called a continuous variable. You just make assumptions about con continuous variables. And it depends upon the disciplines. In uh, uh, When you're looking at the hard sciences, okay, you're looking at time. Time can be divided into microseconds, micro, uh, na nanoseconds, macroseconds. Oh, no, there's no macro, there's millisecond. So you can divide it as small as you want. Okay. So continuity is very relative. In business, in psychology, this number might be seven. In business, what we say usually is that if number of possible answers is five or greater for an ordinal variable, not for a nominal variable, never ever for a nominal variable. But for an ordinal variable, if the number of possible answers is five or greater, then I can assume this variable to be continuous. Why do we assume a variable to be continuous? Why do we want a variable to be continuous? Because if once we get into continuous variables, we have lots and lots of great tests available. When we are working with categorical variables, we have a very limited set of variables that are available to uh, of tests that are available to us. The moment we get to continuous, even if one of the variables is continuous, the number of tests that we can run goes up exponentially. And those tests are statistically a lot more valid than what we are going to learn today. We are, of course, today just going to look at the scenario where you are working with categorical variables. Remember we looked at mean? Right? There is no mean for a nominal variable. Think about it. You have males and females, will there be a mean? Let's suppose we have 50 males and 50 females, the mean is 0 0.5. Females being zero, males being one. What does that 0 0.5 mean? Nothing. Okay. Let's look at ordinal variables. 25 to uh, income, zero to 25, 25 to 50, 50 to 75. Zero standing for 0 to 25, 1 standing for 25, 52 standing for uh, 50 to 75. The mean is 2.6. What does it tell you? Nothing. It's not representative. So mean doesn't mean anything at all. All that you can do with categorical and or, uh, all that you can do with categorical variables is probably talk about the mode. What is the mode? If you've forgotten, a mode is the frequency which has the highest number. What is the frequency? Frequency is the number of responses. I'll explain that with graphs in a few minutes. But when you are working with categorical variables, you have only one test that you can run, which is the chi-square test. Individually running tests with categorical variables is, is impossible. There is one small little test that you can do, but we'll stay away from that. Individually running tests is impossible, and frankly, it's meaningless. So when you are working with categorical variables, there's only one test that's available. When you have two categorical variables, together. So let's suppose we have two categorical variables, which are gender and income. So there are gender and income. 
income, there are two categories, sorry, three categories, the ones that we've been talking about. Gender, there are two categories, which are males and females. Now we know that there is an income inequality in terms of gender. Women tend to have a lower pay. I want to prove it. Not that women have a lower pay. I can't do that. Okay. As of right now, I don't have any means available to do that. All I can do, again, this is when you're working with two categorical variables. I can say gender is sometimes this mouse works perfect, perfectly and sometimes it doesn't. It's not the mouse. I'm assuming something else is going on. Gender is related to income. Notice that I only say relation. Gender is related to income, right? I'm not saying anything else. I'm not saying women tend to have a lower income. I'm not saying men tend to have a higher income. I'm not saying men tend to have a lower income. All I'm saying is that there is a relation. Since I have written the alternate, I also have to write a run null, which is gender is not related to income. Notice that I'm not using any mathematical science because whenever we talk about relationships, it's easier to use English. If I started writing a mathematical notation in here, you could write it, it would just be about three lines long. Okay. So we just want to use the mathematical notation where it's simpler and we use English where English is simple. Okay. So notice the fact that it's just a relation that's being talked about. Okay. It's not about the direction of the relationship. Can you do the direction? Not right now, later on. So the first type of test that we are going to run and we are going to create a box. What is that box? It's a lovely diagram which is going to show you. Part of it has been given to you in the, in the lecture notes, but I'm going to give you a better one. But I want to build upon this slowly rather than give it to you at one go and then everything going whoosh. Uh, we are going to build a box. And the first box is going to be Obviously, this is a flow chart. The flow chart has the first question is what kind of variables are you working with? Okay. First box in there is going to be two categorical variables. with two categorical variables, okay? And when you are working with two categorical variables, the only test that you have at your disposal is a chi-square test. So today we start off by looking at two categorical variables. Next week onwards, we are going to move to slightly more advanced territory where we are going to look at one categorical variable and one continuous variable. From there, we'll move on to two continuous variables from where we are going to move on to greater than two continuous variables. To this, we will add two continuous variables plus one categorical variable. And then if time permits, I don't think it will, but if time permits, we will do two, sorry, these are greater than two, greater than two continuous variables plus greater than two categorical variables. If you're not able to do this last one, 
it will be done in 3054. So we coordinate this so that nothing is you know, left out of that entire stream. So it depends upon the time that we are going to get. So we start off with the first step today, which is two categorical variables. Now, as of right now, it's just a list. It should not be a list. And no book tells you this, and no book is ever going to give you a you know, breakup like this. It's more of a flow chart, and it's a set of boxes that I'll provide to you as we go along. Step one today, two categorical variables. Let's go over to uh, SPSS. Hopefully none of you are still, none of you is having a problem in terms of opening up SPSS. I had two emails that I was pretty much able to address all the questions that you had. There were two emails that I could not, and I asked them to go to uh, uh, IT for help, uh, primarily because they were Mac-based systems. So I unfortunately do not have too much uh, of an idea. If you still don't have access to, sorry, if you still don't have access to um, SPSS, please make sure that you do because otherwise you are going to be left very far behind in the tutorials. Okay, So make sure you spend some time on that. All right, so this is our data set. Hopefully you are a little bit familiar with it now. And we are going to be working with two categorical variables today. So let's identify a few categorical variables. The first one, of course, has been around, which we looked at uh, last week, the three types of cards. One standing for American card, two standing for European, three standing for Japanese car. Okay, so three types of cards. Is this an ordinal variable? No, it's not. Why is this not an ordinal variable? Because one could be a European car, two could be a Japanese car, three could be an American car, and we wouldn't know the difference. It doesn't make a difference at all. Coding is based on what? Coding is based on arbitrary assignment. It's a nomination. Not only is this a categorical variable, it's a nominal categorical, uh, nominal categorical variable. It's something that I think I forgot, which was for ordinal variables, five or more levels, you can assume it to be continuous. For nominal variables, you can never, ever assume it to be continuous, which means you are living with half your hands tied behind your back, but we'll talk about that once we reach that problem. Let's look at another one. So this is type of car. Let's look at, uh, I think I used age in the other video, so I'll go with that the age of the other respondent, the age of the respondents. Look at the age of the respondents. What kind of variable is this? It's a categorical variable. Why? Because it's classified into categories. Can I assume it to be continuous? Yes, I can. Why can I assume it to be continuous? Because it's an ordinal variable and it's got five or more possible levels. So I can assume it to be continuous. For today's sake, and I know I'm doing this on purpose, for today's sake, I'm going to assume that this is not a continuous variable. Just to show you that this assumption is something that you make. There is absolutely nothing wrong with assuming a, uh, an ordinal variable to be continuous, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with assuming it not to be continuous. That's a hint for your project. I will have a video for the project probably before the beginning of next week. So that's also going to be a component. So I'm going to work with these two variables. Before I start uh, looking at the test, I'm going to introduce you to something that we are going to be spending a lot of time on. The first tab, which is within Analyze Descriptive Stats. Now, we are going to spend our entire trimester in this tab. Okay. We'll do descriptive statistics. We'll do mean comparison. We'll do general linear models, a little bit if time permits, correlation, and regression. So those are the ones that we are going to be working with. If you come back to me and we do 3090 together, 
there's a lot of stuff in here extra that we're going to do we're going to do a little bit of direct marketing we're going to do spatial temporal with primarily spatial marketing not using spss but other softwares too obviously you will also do a little bit of simulation to show people to show your managers what can be done what the expected outcomes are and so on okay so we are going to in our this trimester spend only time on descriptive statistics as i said a little bit of uh, general linear models if need uh, arise uh, correlation and regression and regression those are the ones that we are going to be spending time on so today we start off with the first one descriptive statistics and i am going to be drawing for you a frequency table it sounds simple okay. and the answer is it is simple and you start off at the basics and even something as simple as a, a frequency table can be converted into a test which is what we are going to be looking at today. So let me start off with one of the variables that we are looking at, which is type of luxury car. Uh, since uh, this was a part of the other video, I'll go ahead and do this in this one too, which is an SPSS analysis uh, screen that pops up has three components. What are those three components? The first one is the one on your left, which is known as the variable window this lists all the variables if you right click on the on this you can change instead of the labels to the names right now this might not make sense but later on during the semester when you're familiar with the data a lot you can go back and work with this so right now i'm just going to go with the labels the box on your right it's called the analysis window and the third thing is the buttons on the right which allow you to enhance the test that you are running okay. so the first thing we are going to do is something very simple which is take the variable that we're analyzing type of luxury car to the right why because that's the variable that we want to analyze press ok and you're done what does it tell you it tells you that 58% of my respondents, sorry, 58 people bought an American car, 38 bought a European car, and 59 bought a Japanese car. Which means American cars and Japanese cars, very similar amount of sales. European cars tend to have a lower amount of sales. In my sample. How is this useful? Nothing. All it's doing is telling you probably what the distribution of or what the sales of three types of cars looks like uh, sometimes somebody might come in and say yes these numbers are fine but can we make this visually more appealing because managers are not going to look at these numbers they're going to look at graphs there are multiple ways there are at least three ways of drawing these graphs and there is this whole thing which SPSS does is let you build charts I'm not so focused on charts because market research by itself is not going to be so focused on charts. I am going to use, most of the times there are inbuilt charts in the test that you run. Okay. So charts, by chart, pie chart, sorry, <laughs> bar chart, pie chart, and histogram. Okay. Bar chart is the most innocuous kind of chart, which just takes, tells you, what the distribution is like in a circle all of us know about this let's make one and then we look at the not so innocuous ones what did i press there you go sorry i was talking about a bar uh, a pie chart not a bar chart let me do that again uh, analyze i was saying bar chart and doing pie chart or the other way around there you go. Pie charts are the most innocuous ones. All you do is get a circle and you get a visualization. That's it. Okay. Now the problem arises in the other two types of charts. A bar chart and a histogram. What's a bar chart? What's a histogram? 
a bar chart and a histogram look very, very similar. Very similar. There isn't too much of a difference across those. Okay. But a bar chart is drawn for a categorical variable, whereas a histogram is drawn for a continuous variable. You do not draw a histogram for a categorical variable. You do not draw a bar chart for a continuous variable. The only visual component that's going to be different, and let me, let's make both the charts so that you know what the difference is. The only difference that you're going to see is that for a bar chart, the bars are going to be relatively far away. For a histogram, they're going to be close to each other. So why is it that, uh, given that SPSS knows that the variable is an ordinal variable. It's allowing me to draw a histogram. SPSS has an IQ of zero. It is zero intelligence. It'll do whatever you ask it to do, unless it's mathematically impossible. It'll do whatever you want it to do. You need to make sure that what you're doing is correct. So let's start off by doing the correct thing, which is a bar chart. Three bars, Japanese European and American. And look at the space between them. There is some space between them, which the reason why you have space is because what you're telling the uh, computer, telling SPSS, is that the three of these are separate entities. It's not an order. If, on the other hand, I told SPSS that I wanted a histogram bunches these together because it assumes it's the same variable which is going up and down, okay. which is con there's continuity in here. In addition to that, whenever you draw a bar chart, all you get is a chart. Whereas if you draw a histogram, you get the mean, the standard deviation, because now it's calculating a mean. Why? Because the continuous variable. Remember what we said? Ordinal variables and nominal variables. It doesn't make sense to have a mean. Means are only for continuous variables. The only thing that you can do with a categorical variable is probably tell me what the mode is. What is the mode? Mode is a Japanese car. What's a mode? The answer which has the highest level of frequency. Okay. The answer that has the highest level of frequency is the mode. That's about the only thing that you can do as far as a categorical variable goes. Some people say median. Median might work for ordinal variables, but certainly not for nominal variables. Okay? So keep them on the side. Those are variables that you cannot calculate means for. Remember that. Very important. Okay? Now, what we are going to do next, so you've had a look at frequency distributions. What we are going to do now, frequency distributions is show you how everything is distributed. We are going to take two frequency tables and bunch them together. What does that imply? Let's do this first because that's probably the easiest way of explaining this. Analyze descriptive statistics cross tabs. Remember the two variables that I told you about? Type of luxury car, age of the respondent. So what I'm going to do is draw a two-dimensional frequency table. One with the type of luxury car, the second with the age of the respondent. How does a cross tab help? <coughs> a cross tab only helps you to see if there is any kind of, <coughs> sorry, visual relationship between two variables. Which one goes into row and which one goes into column doesn't make a difference. Okay. It's exactly the same. Won't make any difference whatsoever. You'll get the same results. So let me come to the output and then see if you know there's any pattern that we can decipher. Let's press OK. okay. So look at what's happened in here. The 
Rows are, Ameri are the type of cars, type of luxury cars. The columns are one, two, three, four, five, are the age groups. So age groups, type of car. And then you have the number of people in each of these groups. So 35 years and under, two people have bought an American car. 65 plus years, eight people have bought an American car. 45 to 46 to 55, 16 people have bought a Japanese car. That's how you read a cross type. Now I want you to spend one minute on looking at this table while I drink my tea and see if there's any pattern that you think you can decipher. you looked at this, spent some time on it. Visually, again, we are doing something very basic right now. By the end of the term, nothing is going to be visual. In fact, it's going to be non-visual on purpose. Right now, however, baby steps, what do we see in here? It seems to me that people who are 35 and under tend to prefer Japanese cars, right? 36 to 45 still tend to prefer Japanese cars, right? But once you get over that 45 year old, 45 year hump, suddenly the preference for American cars seems to increase. European cars are nowhere, they're never on top. So something happens at the age of 45 and then you suddenly tend to buy American cars. It might be anything at all. You're old, so you're more patriotic. You're old, so you don't have too much money, whatever be it. We have no idea what the logic behind this is, but there seems to be a pattern in here, which is older people tend to support, tend to buy American cars. It's a visual examination, nothing over and above that. Next question is, can I prove it? Can I prove it? Okay. Before I prove anything at all, what's the first thing that I need to do? I need to write an alternate. Let's write an alternate. What's my alternate? There is a relation between age and type of car bought. Done. There's a relationship, there's a relation between age and type of car bought. What is the relation? No idea. What is the relation? I can't put it in words. Well, actually, I can put it in words, but I can't test it. I can't put it in hypotheses. I know visually looking at it, when I actually... We'll look at all of these later. If I'm playing with two, cat two categorical variables, the only test that I have at my disposal is a chi-square test. What's a chi-square test? A chi-square test is a test between two categorical variables. And the basis behind a chi-square test is a cross-tabulated table. So statistically, I'm going to look at patterns in this table and tell you if a relationship exists. How do you do that? Analyze 
descriptive statistics, cross tabs. Everything stays the same. Everything is in here. I am now going to enhance this cross tab. And this is how we are going to work with each and every one of the tests that we are going to do. Click on statistics. See the chi-square? Click on it. So you're asking for a chi-square test to be run on the cross tab that you have produced. Press continue. We are not going to look at any of the others, so just forget about those. Continue. Press OK. So we get the cross tab again. In addition to that, we get a new table, which is the output of the test, the chi-square test. The Pearson chi-square test, there you go. What are the others? The others are different types of tests. We don't care about them. 99.99% of the times the results are going to be exactly the same. We care only about the Pearson chi-square test. This Pearson guy is going to come up a few times. So we are going to go with him because he's the most famous of them all. So Pearson chi-square test is what we are focused upon. Now, SPSS does not use the term P pretty often. What it uses instead is what you see in here, which is called significance. Significance and P mean exactly the same thing, okay? They're exactly the same thing. And in this case, P is equal to 0 0.002, okay? P is equal to 0 0.002. What is that in terms of percentage? 0 0.02 is 2%. 0 0.002 is 0.2 percent. Okay. What does this 0.2 percent mean? Very careful, it's always going to be translated into the same thing, which is there is a 0.2 percent chance that your alternate is incorrect. 0.2% chance that your alternate is incorrect, which means there's a 99.8% chance that your alternate is correct, right? So we'll go with my alternate being correct. What is my alternate? There you go. What is the alternate? The alternate is that there is a relationship between and I can tell you that there's a relationship. What is the relationship? Stats is not going to tell you that right now. Okay? It can't tell you why, because we're dealing with categorical variables. There is a relationship, but that's about it. Nothing over and above that. Okay? So I can safely say my H naught, again, apologies to statisticians, but I'm going to say my H naught is incorrect and my HA is correct. How did I decide upon that? I looked at the significance. Let's do one more of these. Instead of looking at type of car and age, let's look at <clears throat> type of car and uh, income. So is there a relationship that exists between the type of car that you buy and your income. Okay. So luxury cars, if your income increases, is there a pattern that is shown in terms of you preferring Japanese cars or American cars? So let's write down our alternate. <clears throat> what is our alternate? Our alternate is there is a relation between and type of car bought. I'm sorry about this. Uh, 
typing is not really an option because we're using too many mathematical symbols so um, and the laptop doesn't work too well but, you know, we'll just have to live with this so there's a relationship between income and type of car i'm going to read these out multiple times just in case you have problems what is your h not your h not is there is no relationship between income and type of car bought okay why is my ha not let's say there is no relation because no relation means everything is equal and equality cannot be a part of your ha it's always got to be a part of h not okay so ha and h not are uh, done both the variables are categorical so the only way i can run this test is using a chi square so let's run a chi-square between income and type of car bought. Let's get rid of all the output that we have. To do that, you press Control A and delete. Analyze, descriptive statistics, cross tabs. So instead of age, we are doing income. Our chi-square is still checked. Press continue, press OK. Point zero 0.08 point zero 0.08 is that less than point oh 0.05 no it's not it's greater than point oh 0.05 okay. what does it imply there's an 8.8 percent .8 chance there's an 8.8 percent .8 chance that your alternate is incorrect which means there's a 91% chance that your alternate is actually correct. But we have said we are only going to accept something if the chances of being incorrect are less than 5%. This is 8%. So we do not accept this. The alternate is incorrect. Why is the alternate incorrect? The alternate is incorrect because P is greater than 0.05. Hence, the alternate is incorrect. The alternate is therefore discarded. And the null continues to be correct. What was the null? There is no relationship between income and type of car bought. Uh, I'll stop here. I've done a few more examples in the other tute, uh, which you can look at, but you're going to be going through those in the tutorials anyway. Um, practice a little, because practice is what is going to give you perfection in here. There is no other way of learning the materials. You can watch these um, tutorials, you can watch these lectures multiple times, but practice is what is going to make you perfect in this particular area. Again, if you have any questions, Feel, feel, feel free to you know, message me on Teams whenever you want, okay? and I'll answer you as soon as I can. Office hours are uh, they're quite meaningless right now, so uh, if I have the time, I'll come online then and there and have a chat with you. If I don't have the time, I'll schedule something with you. Avoid emails. I've been telling you that uh, for the past uh, two weeks, I think. Primarily because your emails tend to get buried. You should see the number of emails I get. While I was recording this, I have <laughs> 39 emails in one and a half hours. So that's why things tend to get buried. Preferably use MS Teams. That's where I will be able to get back to you. Okay? Uh, your test results should be out soon. Uh, hopefully before the end of... Uh, next week and they will be uploaded on blackboard again i'm not involved in your grading at all but if there are any questions i'll tell you who you want to have a chat with most of you will want to have a chat with your tutors there are a few exceptions but other than that uh, again if you have any questions feel free to send me a message take care uh, saying keep safe doesn't seem to do the job but i'll see you all next week bye